Lord, we need your mercy, we need your patience, we need your love and grace at every moment. We're thankful that all of these things you have in far greater supply than our need. And so we call upon you for those today. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Charles Spurgeon has been called the greatest preacher that England has produced. He preached to more than, a, uh, more than 10 million people over 38 years of ministry in 19th century London. And Mr. Spurgeon attributed his success to the faithful prayers of his congregation. When people visited him in the huge metropolitan tabernacle there on the banks of the Thames River, he would take them down to the prayer room in the basement. And people were always praying there, and he would say, this is the powerhouse of our church. In a minute, I want to think about how praying together and the life of the church merge. We're going to talk about that at a later point this morning. Today is Epiphany. This is the day that Eastern Orthodox Christians celebrate Christmas. And today we remember the coming of the wise men to Bethlehem, their worship of the newborn king and presenting their gifts. We remember the brutality of King Herod, a mass murderer, and we read of his mass murder in the early chapters of Matthew. When the wise men came to see Herod, he told them to go and search diligently for the newborn king. He really didn't need to say that because they were already pretty heavily invested in this search. Put yourself in the place of one of these wise men this morning. Uh, many scholars think that they came from Persia. And so if that's the case, imagine that you've come from what is now the nation of Iran and you've traveled either on foot or riding on camelback for around a thousand miles, a thousand mile adventure through the desert. You've already invested 50 days, 60 days, quite a long time in this adventure. You would not be easily dissuaded from your search after you had invested that kind of time and energy into it. You would not say, well, we've come this thousand miles, We've been here in Jerusalem a day, and we haven't found what we were looking for. I guess it's time for us to go back to Persia. This was not the frame of mind. This was not the attitude. This was not the focus of these men. They were intent on completing the search and finding this newborn prince, this newborn king. Herod had been full of insecurities. He was terrified that a new king might be rising up. The Old Testament prophet Micah had written that a ruler would be born in the village of, Jeru of Bethlehem, which is today just a suburb of Jerusalem, a West Bank village that caters to tourists, if you've ever been there. It's also the home of Bethlehem Bible College. You might not have known that there's a Bible college today on Hebron Street. If you're ever in Bethlehem, you can look it up. Uh, Bethlehem Bible College, which is uh, an organization that trains Palestinian Christians, Arab Christians, for Christian ministry. And there are about 135 students there who are part of that. When you think of Bethlehem, you should pray today for those folk who are part of, of Bethlehem Bible College in the middle of a hostile environment. They're surrounded by a majority of Palestinians who are Muslims. They're surrounded by the Jews and so this is a, an interesting group and one that, you, that we should be remembering as we think of this. <clears throat> when the wise men left Herod and set off for Bethlehem, the star appeared again, and the same star that had prompted their 50-day journey was still with them. They were delighted to see this again. It led them until it hovered over the place where the child was, and... Their search was over. With joy, they entered the house there, and they saw the baby with Mary, his mother. They brought to him their gifts, and they worshipped him. 
It would have been great to complete that adventure in that way. But it was a great adventure. It was perhaps, don't you think, that might have been the biggest trip of their lives. This was not some little whim. This was a central search, and uh, we can imagine that this, the trip would have occupied their memories and their conversations for the rest of their lives. This morning, I want to challenge you as we begin 2013 to intensify your search for Jesus. The wise men were pretty intent on finding this newborn king. I want to suggest to you, to challenge you, to encourage you that this is a person who is worth finding and a person who is worth knowing because he's not merely the king of the Jews. He is the savior of the world. He is very God of very God. And you cannot live your life to the full apart from this man. So I want to encourage you in this search in 2013. Don't let Christ be an afterthought in your life. Don't let him be a good habit in your life. But make a place for him in the center of your life. Let him occupy your thoughts. Let him occupy your time. Search for him with all your heart. I think of the words of Jeremiah who said, who said the words of God. He said, you'll find me when you search for me with your whole heart. That's the kind of challenge I'd like to give to you today. And specifically, the challenge in the matter of praying together. Brook Hill has had an ongoing prayer chain for many years, long before I was here. It probably began as a phone tree, and now it's an email system. And we receive prayer requests each week, and we pray for them. That's a beautiful ministry and an important ministry, and one I want to encourage you to, uh, to be part of and to, and to be faithful to. But like most churches, in my own experience, we have put far less focus on two or three or five people getting together to pray. Not to talk about the ravens, not to talk about the redskins, not to read the Bible and bring our own opinion from whatever left field place we may want to bring it, but simply coming together for the purpose of praying together. I sense that this is one of the things that God purposes to do among us this year. And I don't say that lightly. I really believe that, that it would be God's purpose and his plan for us in moving to the next level in many aspects of prayer to think about ways that we can come together simply for the purpose of praying. Most of us speak and think of prayer as important, but it's kind of a thing that we can casually uh, toss off as well. We see someone who is sick and we'll say, I'll pray for you. Someone who is in trouble will say, I'll pray for you. It would be good for us to be in a position where we could just go ahead and pray for them right there. You've heard that before. I'm just telling you, you're much more likely to get me to pray for you if you come up to me and I recognize that you have a need and we've got time to pray. We can make time to pray right then for a minute or two rather than for me to go home with my own forgetful self and never even think of you until I hear whatever happened to you a week or two down the line. Uh, maybe on Facebook you've seen a post like this, sending thoughts and prayers your way. Well, that's a good, good post, I guess. Um, with all due respect, I may be sending thoughts your way, I may be thinking about you, but what good will it do if I'm just thinking about you? It will generate some sympathy. Maybe my heart will beat with your heart in some way, but it won't really help you. I need to pray. I need to come before the God who can make a difference to the one that we believe has the power to heal and the power to help and the power to encourage and the power to transform lives. If all I'm doing is thinking about it, well, a good thought is a fine thing. I don't want to poo-poo that, but it's far from what is needed. May God help us to move beyond thinking about people, sending good thoughts to really praying for them. 
We have the example of the early church who got together often to pray. In Acts chapter 2, we read that early believers devoted themselves to prayer. In Acts chapter 4, we read that in response to persecution, they raised their voices together in prayer, and when they had finished, the place was shaken where they were meeting. We read in Acts chapter 12 that believers gathered together to pray for Peter's release from prison in the house of Mary, John Mark's mother. And an angel assisted Peter in the jailbreak, and this was apparently a result of his friends praying there on that particular evening. In Acts chapter 13, we read that the leaders of the Antioch church got together to pray together, and as they were praying, as they were fasting, the Holy Spirit separated Paul and Barnabas for the work of missionary evangelism, and all of the course of Christendom was changed because of those folk getting together to pray on that day. So praying together was a normal activity for early believers. If we were to look, we would find at least 17 passages. I found a website that listed them that encourage us to pray together, and probably we could find more than that. Yesterday was the memorial service here at Brook Hill for Mary Kiersey, a dear lady. Many of us knew her, respected her, loved her. We know her husband, Jim. Last month, on the day that Mary died, Pastor Dana and I were visiting there in their home. And Jim told us that for many years at dinner time, sitting there at the table, that Jim and Mary would pray together. That was part of their plan every day. They would pray for family, they'd pray for friends, they'd pray for Brook Hill Church and for many of their friends here. It really struck me. I've believed for a long time that a married couple praying together is the highest form of human intimacy. Sexual intimacy is relatively easy by comparison with spiritual intimacy. And a husband and wife praying together is something that the enemy will seek to disrupt by any means. It may be that as you're listening today, you're realizing that you need to take some step, some small step initially, to begin regularly praying with your husband or with your wife. The, the Kiersey's experienced this intimacy well into their 80s. What a model. What mentorship this is for us. Now, praying together presupposes that we have some degree of comfort with praying aloud. And I know that this is an issue for some of us. And if I had another hour to preach, I, we, could, we could deal with that. I've got the notes here, but I don't have time for that. Okay? But... I just want to say this, that could there ever be a better environment for you to begin to learn and practice praying aloud than if it was just a group of you and one other person who was a friend praying together? I can't think of anything. that It won't be easy. I'm not saying it will be easy. It might be hard for you, but it will never be easier than to do that with one person as opposed to getting up here and doing the pastoral prayer. No. You have an opportunity to do that. You, we only learn this by doing it. I don't know how to, else to tell you. I can give you some instructions, but ultimately it's just something that you get to do and you learn by doing it. Can I have a witness for this? How many found this hard when you began to pray out loud? Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's kind of supernatural rather than natural, and uh, it's not surprising that it's a little bit difficult for us. Where are we going to begin? I think the easiest place to begin would be in that group of two or three. In fact, when Jesus said, if you gather together in a group of two or three, there I am with you, I think that there's something to that beyond what we often think. I really think that there's really a power in that dyad or triad, whatever they call that, a group of people coming together. There's something peculiar spiritually about two people coming together to worship and to pray. So I'll pass over my instructions for learning how to pray out loud. 
There's another part of prayer that's more difficult even than learning how to pray out loud, and that's learning to listen. Listening is at least half of what prayer involves because prayer is not just talking to God. Prayer is a relationship. Prayer is a dialogue. And you can't have a dialogue unless two people are communicating and he's wanting to speak to us and we need to be listening to him. And sometimes it's really hard. Our lives are busy. Our lives are hectic. Most of us spend far too much time, let me just say, on email and Facebook and Twitter and smartphone. And God doesn't usually speak to us through the smartphone. He doesn't tweet every day. Did you know that? You can't really listen. I mean, no, don't get me wrong. I've got some good Christian friends who put a lot of good stuff on Facebook. And maybe God can speak through that. But I, I want a direct line with God. I don't, I don't need somebody else inspiring me. I want to hear what God has to say. And it's hard. But if I go to bed at a reasonable hour so that I can get up early and spend time just listening to God before I do anything else in the day, then... Maybe I can hear him. If I can do my five-mile walk with God and without my MP3 player, then maybe I can hear him. Maybe I can hear his voice. It's very quiet in here. <laughs> my own experience of praying with other men began in the mid-1980s. I was part of a church in Damascus, and some blue-collar guys started meeting at the church building every weekday, Monday through Friday, at 4 a.m. From 4 to 5, they would, they would come and pray, and they're blue-collar guys, so their job starts at 6 or whatever, and then they're on their way after an hour praying. And then some other men started meeting from 5 to 6 a.m., and since I live right next to the church in the parsonage, I felt kind of, what? <laughs> Obligated, that's exactly what I felt. And so at 5 to 5, I'd pull on my pants and go across the parking lot, and I'd be part of that 5 a.m. prayer time. And uh, hardly ever were there more than four or five guys, sometimes only one or two. But they were persistent, and there was a pattern that we used that followed the Lord's Prayer, breaking each phrase down, and, and, and you can go five minutes with that. There's a whole, it doesn't take too long to take up an hour if you've got a plan and you're working the plan. It was a beautiful thing. And something began to happen there at that church. I think it was related to what was going on at 4 a.m. and 5 a.m., we, the church had just gone through a difficult time and some people had left. And truthfully, the people had left were the people that I was more closely connected to than the people who stayed. Uh, but something began to happen as these men continued to pray. And Sunday mornings, it was just, there was just a, something I can't really describe except to say that it was a strong feeling of family and unity, and love, and it was palpable in that place. And we didn't have a good visitor's uh, greeting program at all. But people who came to visit wanted to come back. And so the numbers began to grow. And we'd be singing songs of worship on Sunday morning. Believers would come forward as, as the songs were being sung to pray for whatever, and we welcomed believers to come forward to pray as the singing continued. And unbelievers, people who had not identified as believers, would be there and they would come forward and they might not even really know what they were coming forward to except that they knew that God wanted to do something in their lives. And this happened so many times, so many times. It was very disruptive. Can I say? It was very disruptive. If you like a service that's a one-hour, well-ordered service, you would not like this. But God was really doing some powerful things in people's lives. And uh, so one service went to two services on Sunday morning. One 
day, the pastor said, well, we were, it's noon here. We've got to head along. Can you come back tonight? So the service started at 6 o'clock, and it was packed. And that began a Sunday night service. It lasted often for two or three hours. And for me, the music guy, I had to have 30 songs ready because you never knew what was going to happen <laughs> on Sunday night. Singing, praying, exhorting, reading scripture, some tomfoolery thrown in the middle of it. And God was doing a powerful thing there. And over three years, the church grew from about 130 to 450. And it was God's work. And I think it began on Mondays at 4 a.m. I... I'm going to tell you about uh, when God, God puts you in really uncomfortable places when this starts to happen. A woman came up to me at a, after a service, she said, and her friend told me, she said, this lady is legally blind. And the lady said, will you pray for me? That, that I can see better? So I thought, okay, this is a first and I prayed, and I felt so bad about my prayer. Seriously, I felt so bad about my prayer. I, I opened my eyes, and I said, Lady, that was an awful prayer. You need to find somebody else to pray for you, because that didn't have anything. There was nothing there. And I don't know, maybe she did. I heard three months later that she saw well enough to get her driver's license. It was one of the weird things that God does. And I don't know if that's what God wants to do at Brook Hill. Because he puts on a different look in a different place, just kind of like the Redskins' offense and defense, right? It looks differently, and you can't ever say what it's going to look like. And hopefully it looks good. But I do know that God wants to help many of us move to the next level in our prayer lives in 2013. Don't you think? Don't you think? He wants to take us somewhere. This is a journey, and he has a plan, a purpose for us for 2013. The Lord is challenging some of you right now to move to the next level in your experience of personal prayer I want to encourage you to think about starting a prayer journal. This will help you much with wandering thoughts at 4 a.m. or whenever you do it. It's something very concrete about just writing out a prayer to God. It's writing a letter to him. It's something just concrete. I really love, love it, and I don't want you to read my prayer journal because a lot of those prayers are just pity poor me. Life sucks. <laughs> and you, <laughs> you don't want to read those prayers, but it's an adventure, you see. It's a journey. And there's benefit in it. Don't you know that God is leading us from a lower place to a higher place? That's the way that it works. God is challenging some couples here this morning to begin praying together, even if it's by baby steps to begin praying together regularly. I, I know that. And it's also my hope and my belief that God is creating within some of us right now a desire to speak with a friend or two about meeting together regularly to pray. Don't talk about politics. I have hidden so many of my friends on Facebook because they're doing one, they're left or right. I just am tired of it. I don't need that. I would rather hear nothing from them. I, lo I love them. They're still my friends, but I'm trying to think if anybody at Brook Hill fits in that category. <laughs> <laughs> but purposefully coming together to pray, not to 
do any of the hundred other things that we do and like to do? Can I say that we don't always think, okay, prayer is the most exciting thing. I can't wait to get there to pray with my friends. There are some things we do because we know it's a good thing to do and a right thing to do, and our body and our desire follows our willpower with that. Do you know that's true? It just begins with a decision that we make sometimes. And who knows where God will take us. When God challenges us when he speaks, we need to have the good sense to listen. Lord, you're here. Holy Spirit, we have already welcomed you and you're here. We want to hear from you today, not just my, my great exposition. We want to hear from you. Touch us, Lord. Challenge us. Convict us. Help us. Have mercy on us. And continue your work of building your body, building your church. It's not our church, it's yours. And we can't build it, but you can. And so we want to say yes to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.